Gallagher from Sweetwater. I'm joined by a very special guest today. We have Nick Perry joining us by Zoom. It's great to see you, man. Hey, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Happy to be here. You got the cool backdrop going on. You're like all vibey. Well, thanks. Uh, <laughs> we're having we're having fun here, man. You know, we were talking a second ago about about this being a new moment in time and and kind of a new frontier. So uh, through the last 18 months, you know, I've had to rethink about how we're going to do certain things, you know? Right. Uh, so right. making a space that felt uh, vibey and inspiring was a part of that for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, we're going to get a little deeper into it, but uh, you went through the whole process of doing an album, releasing it, doing the promo, you're heading out on tour, and you've been doing it all during this whole last 18 months that have been so challenging. Yes, all that is true. Luckily, most of the record was tracked in a two, actually it was a two and a half year period before really the pandemic hit. So really we did like a little bit of mixing, um, but yes, everything else has been done during that time, which has had its own unique challenges. But, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm grateful for the team that is around me and um, my band members and my family, everyone has been super supportive and the fans and people who've, who really stepped up and and bought the album and shared the album and have been supportive of it and have bought you know live stream tickets and now bought physical tickets like it's it's a it's a full thing and it's to work it has to work it has to be firing on all cylinders you know you can't just have one part of it working so uh i'm grateful i'm just super grateful that's yeah. like the theme yeah. of my life right now just gratitude of that um that i'm able to move forward right right yeah man it's so so awesome congratulations the album is sun via and, uh, and uh, in a little bit, we're going to get into some of the songs uh, on that album and how you recorded them and some of the parts you played and some of those things. But let's take a step back. You've been doing this for a long time. I have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was uh, just yeah, fortunate, fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time as a, as a teenager. And uh, my band that I had in high school, you know, we started gigging on South Street, which for people who aren't in Philly, that would be like the equivalent of like Sunset Boulevard or something. Um, so South Street was the street, you know, where everything happened with all the nightclubs and all the rock and roll clubs. And I started playing down there when I was 15. And uh, it just started picking up once a week, twice a week, three times a week, five times a week. We, we had a residency. People were coming in from New York and from LA and Nashville. And we ended up getting into like a bidding war. And I was 16, just about to turn 17. And I signed a deal with Clive Davis. and. I call it joining the circus, right. really, because that's really, I mean, that's not an exaggeration. Like, that's what it was like. I was in high school one minute and the next minute on tour in Japan, and it was just like a total whirlwind, you know? Oh, it had to uh, be. So I've been hanging oh, on be. for dear life ever since. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've had brief moments where I touched down. Uh, but it's, you know, it's just a unique, you know, and we were saying before as well, it's, I don't have anything to compare it to. So it's just, it's my life. It's the way I grew up. I grew up in this business, you know, so to speak. And um, it's had its challenges. But I think every life, every lifestyle, every career path, they all have challenges, right? It's not unique to music. This is certainly a tough business, but there's, you know, life, whatever. It's got its ups and downs. It's, I think it's really your mindset as you go through it and, uh, and what you make of it. Right, right. So that, uh, that uh, big first success was Silvertide, and uh, yes. you were writing songs, you were playing. How long had you been playing guitar at that point, and how long had you been writing songs when you started uh, getting into that band and having that success? I started in earnest at around age 12, and from that first moment, it was like, go. It was 10, 12 hours a day or more from the moment I got a guitar, and, uh, and my aunt gave me uh, Highway to Hell by Pearl Jam on cassette, and I'm, I'm sorry, Highway to Hell, ACDC, and Pearl Jam 10. Those were the two albums on cassette. 
uh, and I got a guitar, and that was it. And that's all I wanted to do. I slept, you know, my parents have pictures of me laying in bed, falling asleep with the guitar, like all the cliche things, but, but it's real, and it, I became obsessed. And I started writing songs the very first day I got the guitar. Hmm. And that was, that was, it's been a huge part of my life and a part of my journey and why I've made some of the, deci the decisions I've made through my career. Honestly, it's all been mostly an effort to write and to perform and play my own music, you know, and I've had opportunities to do other things and I've left other big gigs and other stuff like that. Uh, sometimes people thought I was crazy, but I've just always had this internal thing where it's just I really want to play my own tunes for better or worse, you know, and I don't know why. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, the life of an artist, it's, it's not something that we choose so much as it chooses us. And, uh, you know, there have been times where I'm just like, man, I wish I could turn this thing off. Um, but I can't. And it's like I wake up and I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with the idea of, of trying to get these thoughts out and express them. And um, music for me has been a lifesaver. It's like it's a therapy and it's expression. And uh, it's, you know, something that's so dear to me. I can't imagine a life without it. Right, right. So after after Silvertide, you know, you you touched on it briefly there, but you kind of uh, had a career as a sideman, if you will, for a little while. People like Perry Farrell and, and uh, uh, some others that you you played with through those years. Were you continuing? I'm assuming then to write, and were you producing your own music, or were you kind of holding that on the back burner while you were playing with these other artists and touring? Interestingly, going back to what we we're talking about, you know, only knowing one way, not having anything to compare it to, for for my perspective. Those seven years that I was in Silvertide, um, you know, my my thing was waking up, writing songs, recording those songs, performing those songs. So I didn't really know any other aspect of the business. But when that band came to an untimely end, I was only 22, which is crazy. Uh, and and I had to figure out like, what am I going to do with my life? You know, I don't, I didn't finish school. I didn't, you know, th th this this is the path I chose. So. I moved to LA and I had to figure out how am I going to make a career, make a life, eat food, you know, uh, <laughs> just some basic necessities, you know. Uh, so luckily, you know, again, right place, right time. Uh, I ended up landing a really great gig with Perry Farrell, who's a hero of mine. I remember, you know, being a kid and, and watching the James Addiction stuff and Lollapalooza. And then all of a sudden I'm playing Lollapalooza with the guy who created it. You know, it was truly amazing. Um, but at that moment, I discovered, yeah, you know, there's more things that can be done within this industry. And that kind of gave me the confidence that I could have a life after that band, which, again, was all I had known. Um, so for a number of years, I was doing that. I was playing with other artists and um, writing with other artists, producing other artists, um, touring with them. But ultimately, I kept feeling like this thing inside that was just like, I really wanted to play my own songs, you know, again, and I, I'm not sure why, but it's just it's this weird, like, internal drive. So uh, kind of every road has led me back there. And then, you know, someone will call and I'll go out and I'll do this or that. But, but it's, it's all kind of led me back. And then when I turned 30 and I had a baby, I had like this, you know, this moment where I was just like, okay, I, I have to just draw a line in the sand and go like, this is what I want to do solely because... Uh, and not that I'm not grateful for the uh, for the other opportunities, but you know you only have so many hours in the day, and uh, I wanted to be a good dad and a good husband and a good uh, you know son and a good brother, and uh, I wanted to dedicate the time that I put into music to doing what I really wanted to do, and that's my own songs, my own my own thing. So right. um, forming right. forming this band, Nick Perry and the Underground Thieves was a life it took a lifetime to kind of get back to this if that makes sense it's crazy sure. to think about it that way but but that's really where where i've almost been headed this whole time it feels like right right which brings us up to the new album you said you had been working on that for a couple of years before the pandemic was the band already together at that point or did you put the band together after you recorded the album no so the band the band was together and to be honest when it when it started when when the band started um I, I had in my mind's eye because I, I was living in California, but but again, being from Philadelphia, you develop these relationships with people with you know I had peers that I grew up with in the music scene. I felt a real connection with, and um, I thought, man, in an ideal world, it would just be amazing to actually be able to go back home and and 
uh, not so much have to start from scratch. I mean, you know, these these people that I've I've been making music with since I was a kid. There's all this history there, right? And there's all this camaraderie, and we come from the same kind of social and economic background and all that stuff. And I feel like that's all an important part of sometimes, you know, when we when we love a band, it's like you know these. It's more than just the conversation musically. It's the conversation of life that's happening amongst these people who come together to create something, right? Um, I hope that all makes sense. But uh, so I, I, I knew that I wanted it to be a Philly thing. So I, I ended up coming back to Philly and I was bi coastal for the whole recording process of the album, which may sound mm. fancy, but it was, it had its challenges, you know, because you're always away from somebody. But it took about two and a half years and we recorded in seven different studios and, um, you know, we put it together as best we could with everybody's schedules and ultimately I said I have to just move back because I, I married a California girl so that's why I ended up staying in California for so long so I convinced her very lovingly that we were going to move back <laughs> back to the cold uh, back to Philadelphia so that was like the final piece of the puzzle and then it all just it was like the machine boom just kind of got into gear um, so no, it is. It has been. This is the band I've been. I've been with for a little while, and and there there were some guests on the record that made some appearances here and there, but for the most part, it's the six of us. Right. Right. So tell us about recording the album uh, through that that period of time. Did you go in with the songs arranged, rehearsed, ready to record, or were you writing and arranging in the studio as you recorded? I would say a little bit of both. Um, mostly they were done. I, I'm pretty efficient with doing demos. I have a home studio, and when I get an idea, I sit down and I try to at least get some of the framework out so I can show it and show what a potential version of this would or could be to my bandmates and to my team. Um, sometimes it'll end there, but sometimes just through my OCD nature or whatever, like I try to take it as far as I can. So I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm just doing a demo, but I, you know, my setup at home is is pretty legit. Like I'm I'm not um, really half-assing anything. So I've got real amps, real guitars, real mics, and when I'm even again doing a demo, it's like I'm tracking, I'm recording, I'm making a recording. Um, so sometimes, and with this album, it's crazy to think about it, but some of what I considered was you know, a demo version of X, Y, or Z ended up finding its way into the finished recording, which is unexpected for me, but it just the way it rolled out. So there was a song called Let You Know, where I laid down to just a click track. I, I got this vibe going with a delay, and the delay was kind of regenerating and creating the groove of the thing. And I ended up doing one long take of this song with just one guitar. And I didn't know even for like the instrumental section, the solo, where it was going to go. It was just completely improvised. And when I got done, you know, it was like four and a half minutes or whatever it was. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I don't think for any amount of money I could ever replay that. You know, it just like was a one time thing. So we took that into the studio and everybody overdubbed to that, even the drums, because again, the delay was setting the tempo. And it was one of those things where it just was very organic and nobody wanted to mess with it. And so really there is no one way. I think if you're open, and I've learned this in producing and recording, it's like you have an idea about how something should be done. And there, of course, are you know, times where the expected thing works. You, know, you track drums and bass, and you're overdubbing to that, and it's tight, and, and there's, a, there's a formula, or you're tracking live. And we've done versions of all of that, right? But there also has to be some room left. You don't wanna, you don't wanna squeeze the project, squeeze the life out of it, and uh, take out the opportunity for something magical or unexpected to happen. And I found through my life, when I, try to, when I let go of the control, is really when stuff kind of starts to happen. I think we all have a tendency to just want to hold on real tight, you know, but uh, if it's one piece of advice I could put out there to people who are producing and making their own music, it's, it's have a vision and, and stick to it, but also leave a little bit of space because you just never know what could happen. And there are a few instances on this record where things came, um, yeah, I ended up using a tape machine and creating like this old school analog flanging effect completely by accident. I had no idea how to work it. It just happened. And it, it's a different version of what the Beatles and Joe Walsh and the Eagles were doing, you know, with those tape tricks. 
but it just, it's what I stumbled into. And then it was like, oh my God, if it's a total accident, but we had to keep it, right? So it's like allowing room for those things to happen. Right, right. Now you can hear that the album, it, there's a, a very organic quality to it. it. It sounds like you've sat down and made music and not constructed music, if you if you understand the differentiation of what I'm trying to say, that, that maybe didn't yeah, come out very clearly. Um, but to me, there's a difference between constructing music and making music. And, and to me, this sounds like an organically played album. Well, thank you. It is. It is as much as, you know, we are organic machines, you know, and, and uh, one thing for me is, and I mentioned being OCD, and, and there is an element of perfection that I, I strive for in my own performances and those in my band, and they'll tell you, you know, I, I love to rehearse. I'm, I, I know there's two schools of thought, you know, don't rehearse too much, um, you know, so that it has like a sort of energy and a spon spontaneous vibe to it, and I get that, but that's not me. I'm like, rehearse rehearse and then when you think you've got it you rehearse one more time because I like to go in and be really confident in the material and then be able to relax and and live inside the song as opposed to thinking about damn what's the next chord change or where am I going after that because then I feel like it's the same thing like when when I'm singing and I'm recording a vocal I will never like read the lyric from a sheet I, I don't feel like you're going to hear my soul my heart and what I'm trying to say if I'm reading it so I will spend the time to play and sing and do the song as many times as it takes to get it inside to where I'm closing my eyes and I'm singing something that's real. And sometimes something weird will come out, a word or a lyric or a phrase that I wasn't expecting or wasn't there in the rehearsal, but it, it, it almost like it had to be there. Do you know what I mean? And for those magical moments to happen, I think that you got to you gotta know the stuff and, and you got to... Um, really go for it. So for me, recording, making a record, it's, it, there, are, there is some similarity with, with being on stage. It's, it's being prepared, but again, going back to what we're saying about leaving room for the unexpected, it's also um, leaving room for those magical s things to happen and taking yourself out of the thinking brain. And I feel like, I'm not trying to go on a rant here, but most of my journey over the last 20 years has been like trying to remove the thinking brain and just trying to get into like the creative vibe space and the inspiration space. I think that's where all beautiful things that we love come from. Art, film, music, they all come from this other place that we're all trying to tap into, you know, but the thinking mind gets in the way. So it's like, it's a journey towards figuring out how to turn that off and focus and live in this creative space. Right. Yeah, that's a huge challenge for, for any artist to do that. Uh, yeah, I think it's a huge uh, challenge for any human being to do that. To be right, I mean, right, right, we're right. living in a in a in a, in a mind-dominated world, but that's for another time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us how guitar tones factor into how you produce and record an album. Because there are a lot of different tones on the album. Uh, there's there's a there's a textural element to the the album as well, where you've you've used the guitars as as kind of part of the. I, well, the texture of, of what's happening in addition to the, the riffs and the, the solos and all those things. But how does the tone impact what you're doing as a guitar player? Thank you for the kind words. Um, to be honest, it's, it's a huge, huge part. And I've mentioned my obsession with songwriting and, and um, you know, when people write me and they ask advice and stuff like that, I, I am always first and foremost talking about the songs. But anybody who follows and, and who knows me knows that I'm I love guitar. Like I've, I have a passion for it um, that runs side by side with the art of writing songs and, and, and artistry, right? So I, I'm obsessed with it and I'll, I'll lose sleep at night thinking about, you know, what if I was able to shorten my cable from the fuzz face to the germanium booster by an inch? Could I get a possibly like clearer bypass signal? You know, like I'm obsessed with, with tone and with guitar and I'm inspired by it and that's the thing is I'm not chasing it for the, for the sake of chasing it. I'm chasing it for the inspiration because when it strikes and when you pick up a guitar and let you know is, again, a great example of that. And I'll show you, um, talking about creating textures, right? So I, by accident, right, I had my guitar on and I had a Univibe on and a delay and the delay it's an analog delay, so it doesn't tell you how many milliseconds. I think it's somewhere around 300 milliseconds, but I could be wrong. Anyway, I just happened to have the pedal set a certain way that day, right? And who knows why? But I started to do this thing.
And it was so like chewy. The tone was so chewy and so, I don't know, and sexy and inspiring to me. I immediately started to sing. When the night falls all around. And it was like, Five minutes later, the song was written, and it just, that's how it happened. So it was, I never would have got the lyrics, the melodies, if it wasn't for the tone and stumbling into this thing. So another part of my process, believe it or not, is I'll spend, you know, any given number of hours just chasing sounds and tweaking knobs and like buying old weird used gear and like seeing what I can figure out or new weird gear and like, you know, trying to figure out like how to make new sounds like, you know, does this Juno 60 sound good through a Marshall and a reverb tank? You know, I, I don't know. Let's hear it. You know, like there, there's really no rules, you know, and and some like, you know, trying to find my way fumbling through the dark uh, into into discovering inspiring sounds. But the guitar has always been for me a driving force. It's the first instrument that I learned and sort of it's home base for me. So, you know, I, I play a little bit of this and a little bit of that but the guitar really for me it starts and stops with the guitar and it's my friend and and my uh my life companion you know right right and you're uh you you work with Gibson quite a lot correct and obviously you've got a firebird today yes i'm i'm grateful and excited i've been playing gibson guitars since i was a kid um my, my first like real nice guitar was a gibson sg i was i mean of course i still am uh you know i love angus and i remember being a young lad and uh, I went to all boys school with the shirt and tie and the whole thing. So when I discovered Angus, and it was like, wow, he looks like I. I, 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 I did. So I come home for school, and I had the outfit on already. I just needed the Jeff cap and the long hair, and then the SG. So I found a Jeff cap with the, like the wig built into it with the long hair. I just popped that on and uh, saved up my money from mowing lawns and shoveling snow, and and I bought a Gibson SG. So um, from that moment on, that's kind of where the love affair started. But I've been primarily a Gibson player my whole career and to be working with them now the team at Gibson now is incredible you know and it's it's crossed over from just really great people you know to work with to being friends right I'm friends with these people now and and uh it's wonderful and a tremendous honor to be working with them in a, ver a variety of ways and um I'm grateful for their support right that's so cool so uh, uh as I mentioned you've got a Firebird there today is that a model you're gravitating toward these days? Is, is, uh, tell us, tell us about that. Sure, this is a this is a 1976 uh, bicentennial Gibson Firebird, and uh, I, I acquired this after the album, but it was one of those things where and and in Silvertide I I played a um, a newer Firebird through through a lot of that stuff, so I was very familiar with the model, and uh, but then there was a big chunk of time where I didn't play Firebirds. And a friend of mine called me and said, man, I think you got to come see this guitar. So uh, I actually met him on the side of the road. It, it, was, it was a turnpike. It was a, P, it was a PA turnpike pandemic guitar deal. <laughs> and uh, we met halfway between Philly and Pittsburgh. And, and I put my hand and I reached into the case and put my hand around the neck. And I was like, I instantly knew. I didn't even have to play one note on this thing. But I knew it was like, it was my guitar. And, you know, I feel like the guitar has a symbi symbiotic relationship with with the player and it, it becomes this thing i mean when i'm playing i don't want to think about playing i just want to be playing if that makes sense so um the way that the guitar feels even above and beyond tone i mean tone is critically important but that's number two for me number one is how do i feel when i'm holding it does it feel right in my hand am i gonna bond with this thing you know um because when i'm on stage and you're sweating and you have you know, all these other elements going against you, playing outside in the wind and the rain and the lights and the fog and the thing. It's like, I need to be able to work my way around this. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's a tool to do my job, you know? Um, so this, this I fell in love with, and I've pretty much been playing this exclusively ever since I got it. Um, I actually, at this moment in time, because I'm between two legs of a tour, I have a bunch of my guitars that are with my tech in Ohio getting some work done. But I have one other guitar with me that I did use on the album. I'll show you. Um, and this is a newer one. One of Gibson's new custom shop. This is a custom shop 59, historic 59. And I named Duck. And this guitar is mind-blowing. And I, I, I've had the honor of playing quite a few real bursts from 58, 59, and 60. And, and when I 
picked up this guitar, I was just in shock of how good it is and how incredible the work they're doing is. It was, it blew my mind. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't lie. I mean, it's just, it just blew my mind. It sounds incredible. And uh, when I got this, I think I was probably about halfway through the record, I ended up using this quite a bit for the remainder of the record. Nice. Well, there's nothing like a great Les Paul. Yeah, man, it just, it, it has a thing. And, and, and I played SGs, like I was saying, as a young, as a young guy until I, until I strapped on my first Les Paul. And then I was like, <laughs> I'm going to be playing this for a while. You know what I mean? It's just like, they, they have a thing, man. They have right, a thing. Right, 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 right. Well, uh, so you, uh, you uh, introduced us there to let you know. Um, tell us a little bit more about that song. Maybe take us a little bit through the process of how you recorded it, how some of the parts came together, how some of the other tones came together. Sure. Well, that one really is is the simplest as far as when I when I stumbled upon that sound, and, and I actually used a Les Paul. It was I, I have a Les Paul custom that's not here. Um, it's like I said, it's getting some work done, but this will get you close. So it was middle position, which is key for this. So both pickups on, and both volumes at seven, not at ten. So it's just a little bit because I get all my and I and I should make mention for people who are watching. A big part of the equation is I'm running amps that are pretty hot. And um, if, for me, it's all about the power tubes, less the preamp and more of that kind of clear, uh, sustain, uh, I don't know, all that harmonic goodness that comes from power tubes. The only, and as you know, the only way to do that is to get the amp working. So uh, that's a big part of it. And when people ask me again, you know, advice about tone, I, I always tell them, like, get, get, a, get a tube amp that is right for the size of your room. Because a 10 watt amp, or in this case I'm, I'm running, uh, Derek is going to take a shot of it, but this is an 18 watt Marshall combo. And, you know, this is a pretty loud amp, but it's, it's not deafening, it's not a stack, right? So this amp, I ha I'm, I'm running on 8. And to get that tone, it's critically important, right? But if, if I could only run, you know, a 10 watt amp or a 5 watt amp cranked up, that would be fine too, as long as it was cranked up. Much better sounding to me than a 100 watt amp on one, which doesn't really have a chance to work. It's not going to give you any of the things we're talking about. That spongy, chewy, harmonic, loud, sustain. It's cleaner than people think, but it, it has all those characteristics that we love, you know? Right. And right. so once that was present, Really, everything else it becomes, you know, like a little bit of a bell or a whistle. But the bypass tone is so sweet and so organic. <laughs> and in all fairness, I'm also running a 1965 Fender tube reverb tank. That's my secret sauce not so secret sauce anymore. Uh, I carry it around uh, with me on the airplane, like that's, that's my carry-on. Uh, I love it, I plug it into every amp that I'm playing and that goes into the front end of the amp. So my guitar, my board, right into the reverb tank and into whatever amp I'm playing. And um, so that is a, as a bass tone is a lot of what you're hearing on the record and then everything else is like a little color. So for example, example let you know, Again, volumes down, both volumes, middle position, both pickups on, a univibe and the, and the delay, the analog delay. Cleans up a little bit. And that's pretty much, in this instance of this song, that's pretty much the whole kit and caboodle. That's, that's the whole song. So I'm using that through the verses, through the chorus, and through the solo as well. And like I said to you, that was improvised, but it was one long take that I never thought I could duplicate. So I just left it and the band overdubbed to that. And this is the only song in my career I've ever recorded with one guitar. There's no overdub, zero. It's just one guitar. And then there's keys. There's a bunch of psychedelic synthesizers and keys and drums and all the other overdubs that went on it, but from a guitar perspective, one soul track. 
Right. Wow, that's, that's incredible. So you played the solo on that original demo track as well? The whole thing was just taken en masse straight in? I swear, yeah. Just one take. Wow. You know, I just, I had no idea. I just, I kept the rhythm going because in this instance, again, it's all, it's all because of the, that delay. So I knew I wanted to keep the groove. So I was... So forth and so on. It just keeps the groove going, you know? Right. And it was all improvised. And again, I didn't want to mess with it after I got it. So That's so cool. That's so cool. So we were talking before, and Thanks. you have, uh, actually by the time this video comes out, I, I think your uh, second single from the album will be released, correct? And, uh, yes. Do you want to tell us? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go no, ahead. no, 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 no. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. It's, it's a song called I Want You. And uh, for that song, you know, that, that's an interesting track because I had written, I, I, I would say that I, I finished a demo and I sent it to my band. And it was in more of like a riff fashion. The, 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 song, the chord changes, the melodies, all pretty much stayed, stayed the same. But it, the song was more riffy and more chordal based. Uh, let me get rid of that delay. It had more of like a thing. And, and the band thought it sounded too much like The Who. So uh, we were just, we got into a room and we just started messing around. And, and Michael Montesano, uh, my bandmate, he, with an acoustic guitar, just started doing this thing where he just started chugging this rhythm. And it changed, it changed the vibe, but in a really, really great way. And I don't know, uh, so I would think... And once we got this kind of chugging rhythm down, I don't know, it just kind of all started to fall into place. So then, then the idea was, what are we playing that is, again, supporting the rhythm and supporting the groove of the song? I mean, again, in this sort of parallel universe, like I'm talking to you about the song and about the guitar, it's, it's, it's a consideration. Of course, I'm excited about guitar stuff and I love guitar, but the first consideration is the song. And, and does the song make you feel something and communicate something, right? And so that's my first consideration. And then everything else is gravy. So in that song, uh, it's all about that groove and laying down that groove. And there's this like beautiful thing that happens between the hi-hat, um, the acoustic guitar, and the bass guitar. And, and, and of course the kick and snare too, but it's like that little foundation that it creates like this bed and it just feels so good. And I wanna like live inside of it. And anything you're doing over top of this, it's like a stew. And anything you're putting in is delicious because the base of it is so good, you know? And, and so that, that was the idea there. And then from, from a guitar part, my, my actual electric guitar part is pretty simple. I'm just basically going. <laughs> Actually, I'm lying. I have tremolo on. If I did you wrong, I did you wrong. And then you start to get the pulse of the tremolo. But what's cool is I ended up doing a whole pass with electric and the tremolo, and then I did another pass, panned them left and right. And because the tremolo isn't always in perfect sync, it creates a bigger, wider stereo image. You know what I mean? Because it's, they're not identical. And anytime that you've got two signals that are panned that are not identical, but pretty close, it just gets super wide. So it created this really nice thing from a guitar perspective um, that I think fills out the track. But yeah, I've got the tremolo on. For my electric guitar, I believe the entire song, even in the bridge. <laughs> slowly start building that back up and I've I've got yeah I think that's about it from from right right that. so did, did you uh did you try to match the tremolo to the tempo of the song or to the the groove or was it just a setting that worked and then you tried to match that when you did the other overdub you know that that is a great question so I in my last musical project I got onto this path 
and I, I had to have a tremolo. I, in fact, I'm trying to remember, I think it was an Empress. It was a really great tremolo. In fact, I probably brought it from Sweetwater. Uh, and, I, and I loved it because you could program like eight or nine, maybe it was eight or 10 different presets, but you could have different tremolo speeds and settings and blah, 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 right? And, but I got into this thing that was almost became a little bit of a burden because I was matching tremolo speeds for every song. And it just became like a thing, like a, uh, like a monster. And, um, and so I decided when I was starting over and I'm going to do this new band and do it my own way and blah, 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 that I was like, I'm going to pick one tremolo speed that just I really like. And for better or worse, that's the speed. If it <laughs> fits into the tempo of the song, cool. If it goes against it, cool, because that's also cool, right? So um, just going to have one speed. So this is my forever now i'm going on record someone's gonna in 10 years totally uh, make me feel like a fool because i'll have changed my mind by then but for right now this is my forever tremolo speed and it just so happened it lined up really nicely with this song it's not perfect quarter notes i think it's pulsing in more of like a um, triplet way but it just it just worked thankfully probably why i kept it because i probably stepped on it during rehearsal, and it went, oh, this really works, you know? Right. But no, I, I didn't, right. I, I have one setting, and I just, I'm leaving it on there so I can just focus my time on other things. Right, right. It's like, like yeah, I said, I get obsessive, yeah. compulsive about things, so I have to be careful. Right, right, it's easy to do, definitely. So I'm hearing the sound through Zoom right now. We'll have an actual recorded track that you, uh, you're you capturing for us there on that end, but, but what I'm hearing over Zoom sounds like it's sort of a rounded pulse to it as opposed to a real choppy kind of a... Uh, kind of a tremolo, which makes it sit a little bit more as a texture as part of the guitar tone. Totally. And that goes back to something that you were saying as well, which is, is through the record, there are textures and, and there are things that are there to give a certain feeling. And I think ultimately, I was talking to a friend about this as well recently, it's, you know, the thing that whether we are conscious of it or not, that when we sit down and we put on a record and, and it's the, the thing that that gets us is the feeling it gives us, right? When you put on Dark Side of the Moon, it's not specifically, oh, it's this guitar sound or this background vocal sound. Or, I mean, all of it is amazing, but it's, I think the general takeaway is that there's a mood and a feeling that you get when you experience your favorite albums, right? And they're all a little different, right? Dark Side of the Moon is going to give you a different feeling than Back in Black is going to give you a different feeling than, you know, whatever spiders from mars but they're they're all beautiful feelings right so i think whether i've been conscious of it or not one thing i've been chasing over the years and something that i really um again maybe i was conscious of it i don't know maybe it's something i've been thinking about without thinking about as weird as that sounds but i i wanted the record to have a certain feeling and a warmth to it and um and i think textured is a really good word and so there are these moments where there are certain sounds that are there for texture, you know? And uh, we have a really great tech named Doc. He came to pre-production and he brought all these old maestro phasers and all these old cool things and he put them on the keys. So we have, um, there's a Wurlitzer with like a old school maestro phaser on it. Again, the part, the whirly part was beautiful. Didn't need, really need anything, but we put this texture on it and it was like ooh, all of a sudden i just got like really warm you know it was like and i love that stuff and so yeah i'm totally into all of that right right yeah very cool i had a uh, phaser three well that was a mutron phaser three that was a, sort of from that same era that i bought when i was a kid oh and, yeah man i've regretted getting rid of that for years <laughs> you gotta hang on to that well with you ebay you, 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 you yeah but you can go find another one you know luckily uh, probably. we're living in, a, in uh, an probably. era where you can find this stuff it's cool i was talking to someone else about that too it's like uh, luckily a lot of this stuff that we you know love from from back in the day is available you know i mean yeah it may take a minute to track it down but with reverb and ebay and you know you can go back and find some of that old stuff you know right plus so many of the boutique Paddle builders are making recreations Absolutely. of those great pedals as Absolutely. well. It's a great time in our universal history. It's a great time to be making music because you can literally, if, you, if there's a sound in your head, you can go find it, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. Right, right. That's awesome. Let's talk about one more song uh, uh, before we, we move on here. And one that I, I wanted to ask you about was Fall. I really liked the, the vibe of that song and sort of the ambience of, of the whole thing. Can you tell us about that song? Thank you. Yeah, that one. Um, oh, boy, I'm going to go back in the memory bank here. So that one, 
uh, was one of the few tracks on the album I did not play Gibson. I believe I was playing an old Strat on that song. And when you when you bend the tremolo arm down with a delay on, you kind of get the modulation of pitch, right? As you go down and then you go back with the bar, it creates, like we are talking about before, like it creates this wideness. And so I believe... Uh, with a lot of those chords, I'm hitting, and with copious amounts of delay and the reverb tank, of course, and I actually think I probably use some plate reverb in the studio as well to give it a big, wide sound, but... I don't have it here, but if I was to go down on the bar, right, you'd start to get that modulation of pitch, and the delay grabs a hold of it and starts bringing back and regenerating the pitch all the way down and back. So you get this like psychedelic thing. And so that was a song that um, I was collaborating with a friend of mine named Kevin Rice. He had a dr he sent me a drum groove, and it was that kind of slow. And I heard it, and I was so inspired by this groove. He did a really fantastic job of tracking drums in his studio. And he's like, dude, I, I just recorded this thing. It sounds kind of Floydian. I'm going to send it to you. I know you love stuff like that. Like, I don't know, see what happens. And he sent me the thing, and it was like, oh. I, I immediately started hammering out this song, because it's like we're talking about like inspiration. And it's like you try to allow yourself to be open to it and to receive it, because who really knows where it comes from, right? So... When you have those moments, I just try to grab a hold of them as, you know, so that was a moment of true inspiration when I heard this groove and I, I just, ooh, I just started laying down this thing in C minor and G minor. Um, e flat, which is a real nice change there. And, uh, you know, it has moments where it's brighter and moments where it's darker. But um, again, it was just following the muse of inspiration at that moment. And it was kind of like this slow kind of psychedelic thing. And the lyrics came really quick. I mean, there are songs, White Noise is a song on the record that's an example of the opposite, where that song literally took like two or three years of just like doing version after version and like grinding it out. And there were moments where I thought I was going to throw it away, you know, but eventually we got it right, you know. Fall, I Want You, um, They Came, Let You Know, uh, They Came when that spark was there, boom, it's like it almost just all came out. And so I, of course, love those ones because, you know, you don't have to spend months and years agonizing over it. You know, you just kind of get it. So I love those moments. And I appreciate you saying that. I, I love Fall. And um, it's, a, it's a special song. That was a, a special song for me. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, speaking of the album, we, we could keep going through all the songs. I, that I wish we had time to uh, do that. But we have to make a big announcement uh, which again, about the time this this video hits, you're doing something very unique in conjunction with Sweetwater and I believe Gibson as well with uh, getting the album out there for people to hear. Tell us what you're doing. Yes, absolutely. It is a truly cool thing. I'm 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 like excited just even saying it with you. But uh, through my friends at Sweetwater and Gibson, we are collaborating to to give away a hundred thousand copies of digital copies of the album, which is. So cool, yeah. and uh, I'm yeah. gonna, for anybody who doesn't, who hasn't seen it. So this is this is what the record looks like. This is a vinyl copy, but uh, we're gonna give away a hundred thousand digital copies of this record. And um, you know, for me, and I, I was thinking about this the other day. It's just like the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate goal, above and beyond anything else, is just to share. For me, is just to share music, is to you know, create something and, and hopefully have it reach someone, inspire someone, make somebody feel good, um, feel something, hopefully feel good um, in the way that my favorite music has reached me and made me feel good, you right. know? And so with that in mind, as the, as the ultimate, ultimate thing, uh, I, I just think it's super cool to be able to have this opportunity and, and to hopefully reach more people and, and to share the music because that's, that's why I'm doing it. You know, I could easily sit at home and, and just make music for me and there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm, I'm, I've dedicated my life to doing it the other way, which is to make it and share it. Um, and so uh, I'm 
grateful to have an opportunity like this and excited. And I, I hope that people dig it and get turned on to it. Maybe there's a, a handful of people who haven't heard, you know, uh, what it's about and get turned on and feel something good. And that would make me feel good. Right, right. Yeah, that's so awesome. So how will people get the free uh, digital copy? There will be uh, provided by Sweetwater and Gibson and, and us from our end as well on the date, which I believe is May Thursday, May 20th. Uh, there will be a link floating around, which will take people to a, a page on our website, which will have the album and you'll be able to just download it. And it'll come with the album artwork, which is cool because... Um, you know, obviously, you know, people can stream the music wherever they want, but, uh, if you get it this way, you get, you know, like as you were holding a vinyl, you know, we did a lot of really nice artwork on the inside. There's all the credits, all the people who worked on the record, which I'm so grateful to everybody who collaborated and made it a reality. It was not a one man show. Uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate to have a, a wonderful group of people who rallied around me to make this a reality. So, um, there's all that stuff. And uh, people will be able to get, you know, the full res artwork, front cover, back cover, inserts, and, of course, the music. So, Right. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that's not the only way you are sharing the music because uh, things are opening up enough that you're actually, you've been out on tour and you're going to be heading back out on tour with Rick Nielsen this summer, right? Yes. Again, gratitude. I've got the best booking agent in the world, uh, CJ Strock from the Mint Talent Group, and, and through this very unusual uh, moment in time. He, he's done everything he, he can um, to, to keep us working and, and to keep us um, sharing music when it's physically safe and appropriate to do so. So we did last year a bunch of drive-in shows that was like pe people would drive their cars in, you know, to like a drive-in movie theater. And it was, they were really fun. It was a little odd, it was a little different, but it, I think the overall takeaway is everybody had a good time. And we were able to share that experience because I think the deeper thing above and beyond just, you know, going to a show, it's, it's I think the thing everyone's missing is this like the idea that we're going to share in this communal experience where everybody in a room or in an atmosphere is all focused on one singular thing and sharing in this one moment together. It's very... It's very like in the now, it's very present, it's very powerful. And whether that's going to a comedy, see a comedy thing or a play or a movie, you know, or a show, a rock show, it's all, it's all doing the same thing. It's uniting a body of people into one singular thing, right? And I think that whether we know it or not, that's a, such a critical part of our human experience. I think that's what's really been bumming people out. It's been bumming me out that we haven't been able to do it. So I'm very grateful, yes. Um, we've got a whole bunch of dates coming up across the country. Uh, I think our first show is in Indianapolis, um, and we're going all around, and we'll be in Georgia and Tennessee, and we just came back from Florida, but we've got a whole bunch of shows in New York and PA and all over the place. And, um, you know, I'm, again, I'm very grateful that we're able to do this again, and uh, we're going to have some fun. Crank up Then I will be cranking up the big, <laughs> the big stacks. Nice. It'll be really, nice. It'll be really loud. Uh, the way it should be, and uh, you know, we hope that everyone will have fun in a safe way. And and every, everybody who's been behind the scenes, like working on these shows, they're wonderful. They're awesome. They're doing everything they can to make all these events really um, enjoyable and safe. And um, again, I'm just grateful to be a part of it. Right. That's so awesome. Well, everyone should definitely check out the album, Sun Via. You want to get your free digital download when it becomes available about the time that this, uh, this video hits. Be sure to look for Nick on tour this, uh, this uh, summer with Underground Thieves. Uh, so glad you're going to be out making music. And man, I hope you'll come visit us here at Sweetwater. It'd be great to have you here. I absolutely would love to. It's definitely going to happen. Good deal. Good deal. Well, thanks so much for your time today. I'm going to ask you uh, one last favor. Would you, sure. uh, would you grace us with some playing as a, a play out for this video here? Give us a little bit of music on the way out? Sure, absolutely. Right on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was really nice to chat with you. Right on.
I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good.